Good morning, everyone. This is Ali Mastardo, Senior Association Manager of PPRA. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on how pro proactivity pays featuring the City of Bend, Oregon. We do have you all on mute and we'll be using the question function on the side sidebar of your screen for any questions. The webinar is being recorded and a copy will be provided to all registered attendees via email and will be posted on roadresource.org. I would now like to welcome Lindsay Matouche, CEO of Vario, who will be facilitating today's webinar. Vario is the marketing firm that partnered with PPRA to create roadresource.org. Lindsay? Wonderful. Thank you, Ali. Um, well, I'm so excited uh, to share, uh, to introduce you all to our guests today. Um, we have the opportunity to hear from the city of Bend, Oregon. Um, as Ali mentioned, my name is uh, Lindsay Matouche. I'm the CEO at Vario. We do the strategic and marketing work for PPRA, but the stars of today are Chuck and Paul, uh, Chuck Swan and Paul Nieswanger. I'm actually just gonna read you their very impressive bios. Uh, Chuck is the division manager for the city of Bend, Oregon, where he has served the community for the past eight years. His tenure in public work spans 38 years, including roles as the road superintendent for the Alameda County Public Work Agency and division manager for the city of Brentwood, California. Swan is known for his dedication and his focus on street maintenance and pavement preservation, a passion that has been a common thread throughout his long career. Pony Swanger is a seasoned professional in the field of heavy construction and paving with a career spanning over 46 years, beginning even before he completed high school in 1978. Uh, it includes a 23 year tenure as a construction superintendent at Knife River, where he honed his skills in construction management. Currently, he serves as a project manager for the city of Bend Streets and Operations, specializing in pavement preservation. His responsibilities encompass managing contracts for paving, chip seal, slurry, microsurfacing, and concrete reconstruction. Together, their efforts in pavement management have earned accolades regionally on the West Coast and nationally. Um, and alongside of Paul, uh, Chuck has established an award-winning street preservation program. The dynamic duo, with the backing of their department director, David Abbas, have significantly improved the street conditions in Bend, under their leadership, the Pavement Condition Index, or the PCI for the city, has risen from 68 to an impressive 76 in just seven years. Currently, the arterials and collectors in Bend have a PCI of 80 out of 100, reflecting very good condition. Um, so they are really a model agency when it comes to figuring out how to stretch limited resources further and um, reverse the trend um, of a deteriorating network into a network that is um, has seen really dramatic improvement. So uh, I'm excited for you to hear from them. Before I introduce them, um, or if I turn it over to them rather, uh, I'll just share a little bit about who's, uh, who's talking to you today. This webinar comes from PPRA, the Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance. It was formed by three associations, EMA, the Asphalt Emulsion Manufacturers Association, ISA, the International Slurry Surfacing Association, and ERA, the Asphalt Recycling and Reclaiming Association. And the three groups came together really to, to, to live up to this one promise, to empower agencies to be the best possible stewards of their road networks and their taxpayer dollars. Road Resource has all kinds of resources um, from webinars like these to a really killer website to social media resources and, and lots of downloadable tools and calculators. And all of that lives up to this one promise. When we started um, this series, uh, the idea was to interview agencies like Chuck and Paul, who um, who really can can do three things. One, demonstrate network level progress. Two, they have a really robust treatment toolbox and they know when to use what. And three, they're stretching dollars as far as possible. Um, one thing I'm excited for you to hear from them today is how they have actually used their progress to justify an increase in budgets from decision makers. Something I know many agencies struggle with. So. Uh, you'll want to key in on um, where they share about how they advocated for an increased budget. Uh, when we started this work with Road Resource, we interviewed um, dozens of agencies all over North America of all different sizes uh, to really understand what were traits of road managers who could show network level progress. Um, and, and here are the four things we found. They use a big treatment toolbox and they know when to use what treatment. Um, we'll talk about that today. They think about the network when they think about what treatments they're going to use on their road this year. 
So each year's treatment plan is considered not just in light of how am I gonna spend my money this year, but how does this year's treatment plan improve my network overall? They learn from the success and innovation of others in similar regions or similar climates. Um, and they're in touch with the industry at large. Um, they're not just out there in their county kind of doing what they've done or their city. Uh, they're, they're really paying attention to what others are doing. And you'll see today, um, Chuck and Paul are an incredible example of that. They've done a lot of educating um, really all over the country, but especially in their area to help others learn from, from their success. Uh, so today we'll talk a little bit about Bend. Um, we'll talk about what happened before 2015 um, when Chuck took over at Bend and then brought on Paul, um, how they did it, how they reversed this trend and gained serious ground in a very short period of time, um, give you tips on growing the budget, and then they do a ton of training and taxpayer communication. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that. And we'll also, as we go, give you a few tools from roadresource.org uh, that you can use tomorrow. So uh, that's that's most of what uh, most of what I have to share, and now I get the great privilege of turning it over to uh, Chuck to tell us about Bend, Oregon. Um, good morning or good afternoon. Um, let me start out with you know Paul and I. What we we're talking about today, we're we're definitely not one of those agencies that have used every tool in the toolbox, but we're growing our toolbox. Um, what we're hoping to share with you today is really how we've built the foundation that we're hoping will carry us long into the future. Um, a lot of that is obtaining funding, um, so we'll, I'll talk more about that later. But um, we are we are not by any more leaders across the nation in, in the amount of products that we use and and, and uh, applications we use, but what we are doing is is keeping that focus of the right treatment at the right time. Um, anyway, on to Ben. Um, we are up to about 900 lane miles um, and growing. 70% um, of our network is residential, but um, right now we have focused on in the past few years of getting our materials and collectors up to an 80 or better um, and been successful at that. Um, our overall network PCI currently is a 76. Um, and we do have about nine miles of road, gravel roads that we're looking at restoration projects on and then a lot of roundabouts. Um, in fact, we're city of Bend's been featured in a calendar from Europe um, as some of the best roundabouts in the world definitely something to look into um next slide some of our challenges in bend um like a lot of mountain towns bend is a, is a mountain town um actually one we have three different microclimates within the city of bend um anybody who's done work in the city of bend knows that uh you definitely pay attention to the weather forecast every two hours because it will change um we get Temperature swings between night and day as much as 70 degrees. Um, we've had snow as late as July 4th. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so um, it it can do it. It's it's a mountain down. Um, we get a lot of sunshine during the summer months, and we do have short construction seasons. So that that that's a definite challenge in in been with contractors, especially contractors that are used to working in uh, Arizona, California. Um, so we, we, our contracts are really specific on timing. Um, we have a rapid growth. Uh, when I started here in 2000, late 2015, early 2016, there was about 83,000 population, and today we're at about 106 and growing. Um, ben is a destination Mecca, um, and I compare a similar in tourism to Yosemite National Park. Um, we get between 2.5 and 3 million tourists annually. And as you know, uh, the challenge to that is we don't get any funding 
from those tourists um, and the impacts to our road system. Um, they also drive a lot of them or, or, or impact driving with, by taking Uber and different things to go around to all the different breweries and um, things they want to do. So um, that, that's a huge impact to our network. Um, resources and band um, are challenging. Uh, wintertime asphalt plants close down. I'll talk a little bit more about that later and how we overcame that. Um, it's um, hard, very limited rock sources. So we're kind of limited to what, you know, what we use for our applications. Um, a lot of times that, you know, the haul, haul top distances are pretty lengthy. And then beer, um, one of Paul and I, we're, I think we're both experts in that field. <laughs> um, but what challenge does beer have other than um, driving, I guess, would be clean water. Uh, that impacts, you know, the water in Ben Avion and our, a lot of our wells are a thousand foot deep, so the water is very pure um, and they want to keep it that way. So we have to be very sensitive to the environment and how that our applications uh, impact that. And next slide. A um, little bit more about Bin. Uh, mentioned that it's a destination mecca. It, you know, hiking, biking. There's 50 lakes within 50 miles of Bin. Um, very popular with kayaking, crystal clear water. You can see 40, 50 feet deep. Boating, kayaking. Uh, people float. Well, I forget how many people float the river every summer. It's hundreds of thousands. Um, that float the Deschutes River, which runs right through town. Um, uh, High-end shopping downtown and five-star restaurants. And again, beer. Um, in this, there's 31 breweries within central centralized location of Bend. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of Ubering and a lot of uh, traveling on the roadway. I'm sensing a theme, guys. It's a great <laughs> webinar. This is my favorite slide in the entire presentation. Yeah. So yeah. Paul and I did a little research. This took a lot of boots on the ground. There, there, we, there was, yeah. you know, if you don't mind, if I jump in there, Chuck and I, we, this was, this took a little time here. So we figured out where your daily consumption was by day of the week. So um, if you ever visit Ben, we'll send you this slide. It might help you out. You can no, beat the crowds. No. We're not we're not engineers, but we uh, we tried our best on that one. Um, Arguably a more exciting graph. <laughs> <laughs> um, this slide right here, um, I love this slide, and, and I think Scott Scott Dimitrov has used it um, in a couple of his presentations. But this really, I'm, I'm going to come back to this slide again a little, bit, a little bit later. But this slide really tells our story. Um, really tells, um, and there's another slide that coincides with this that will really even make it um, make more sense. But you, you can see, you know, you're from 2008, that you know, no road focus at all, roads failing, and um, it, within that time frame, you know, we inherited a lot of roads from the county and annexed in as the city grew. But in 2015-16 is kind of about the time Paul and I started the pavement preservation program. Um, and it took a lot of trust building within that time frame to um, to get our council and our and our uh, elected officials and city manager to really trust that we knew what we were doing and we were doing the right thing and we were building a, a strong program. And, and then you'll see in 2021, 22 things flattened out, um, COVID part of it, but really the focus was trying to maintain our PCI at the same time we were, were researching for some can say, sustainable funding. So more on that one. This is, I love this slide because this is exactly what many agencies that I get a chance to talk to are experiencing, just a slow decline. And year after year, you keep doing the same things, this, this just continues to get worse. And then your words get in worse condition, which requires more money to get them in serviceable condition um, or with any sort of reasonable IRI. But by doing things differently, 
you're reversing this trend and you see like this is the mindset shift right here you have new leadership who's determined to manage things with a proactive network level approach and look what happens um, and we'll see how the funding followed um here's a picture of our current uh, road conditions bro broke down um we have about four, you know, 450 centerline miles. Um, right now, we don't measure our network value the same as a lot of industry. The, this is just our network value based on surface only, not including um, all the other infrastructure. Um, but we use this as a guide um, when we're talking to our city council members and our elected officials and and I'll briefly talk about a, in our time frame where we created a, a budget committee that is strictly focused on transportation. Mm -hmm. um, today's PCI overall network, PCI is a 76. Um, we started out at a 68 and it, it's fluctuated 76 to 78, but um, overall when we try to time our budget process uh, and our evaluations at the same time of year. So at that yeah. at this time, it was 76. This is another line I love on this slide is the network replacement value estimated at 845 million. What, um, it, what I hear from a lot of agencies is that one of the biggest struggles is getting elected officials um, to, to follow a smart proactive management plan. And um, what people often don't realize, a lot of people don't know what the value of their asphalt pavement is, but for many, probably most communities, the greatest asset under their care is the value of their roads. Um, so, so that warrants a smart, proactive investment, just like people take care of their, their homes and other things that warrant um, sizable investments for them, it warrants sizable investment from agencies. So I think that's another cool fact that you have at your disposal, Chuck and Paul. A quick shot of our, our PCI condition today. Um, Paul just pulled this together off of our uh, our um, PCI ratings just in the last couple of weeks. So um, as you can see, um, overall um, the picture looks really really good and good condition overall over the city. Um, one of the things we focus on, and Paul will talk a little bit about this in, later, is um building an equity today when we do our projects uh well, i know a lot of cities fight that you know the west side gets more than the east side or you know or it's economic driven or um you know it's things like that but you can as you can see there's a lot of uh, red in between um we're getting to that point where all of our arterials collectors are at a point where we're just doing a regular pavement preservation treatment in the future, but we're focusing on a lot of also failed roads in between, um, some of which we inherited when we annexed them from the county, um, which were oil matter so roads, um, not designed for today's traffic volumes. So as you can see on some of that southwest and southeast side, um, there's a concentration of, of those particular roads. That's a lot of green, guys. Yeah. Challenges. So it, it wasn't like that um, reversing that deterioration trend was easy. So let's talk about some of what you navigated. So when I first started and 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 uh, first David Abbas, was, I'm going to go back just a little bit. Um, the city prior to 2015 did not have a dedicated street department. So on top of all this uh, preservation focus, we were also building a transportation and mobility department or a street department that focused on maintenance. Um, so it was kind of fun uh, coming here for, after working in Alameda County for almost 30 years and being able to start a program uh, from from scratch, basically. It, Paul and I and, and David Abbas, our director, Davis be David being that champion fighting for the funding and 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 uh, constantly beating the drum and educating council where Paul and I were given like 17 million dollars to kickstart this program right off the first two years and 
you imagine putting that many contracts out in two years in Central Oregon was a real challenge. Um, we did it, and I think that kick started a lot of trust. Um, but prior to that, there was a lot of bad past practice, a lot of wrong treatments, wrong road. You know, they were attacking worse first. All the things you're you're taught in pavement preservation not to do. Um, very poor material quality. There was standards and specs were didn't exist. I mean, there wasn't a street department to or or, or that focus. And we we're growing faster, hiring a bunch of brand new engineers for the um, development side of things. Um, today we have really strong, robust standard specs, uh, payback policies, and things like that that have really helped us build that foundation. But the growth boom, um, it was really overwhelming uh, in the beginning. Um, and as there was a lot of infill happening at first, a lot of new streets on the in, inner part of the city, um, wasn't a lot, and it was density growth. So um not a lot of new streets which didn't impact our pci a whole lot but um a lot of new apartments inner growth stuff like that franchise utility payback policy was established through paul and uh, you know working on that a lot with our downtown um there was no street maintenance focus prior to 2015. it was we had 3,000 potholes on average a year um, and when I came on board, I, I spent my first six months, seemed like every week on news, on the news doing reports, what are we doing about potholes? <laughs> so, <laughs> and then um, improper paving techniques, um, there was, uh, everybody was using whatever they wanted to use for paving materials. Um, and, Overloaded trucks, and we still have this problem today. There's no enforcement um, for for loaded trucks. So that's just a step that Paul and I have dabbled in, and we've tried to get um, our local PD to become, you know, more involved with. Uh, and we're still working on that, uh, but that does have a, a major impact, especially in the roundabouts and debris and dumping, plus sweeping um, things like that. If I can jump in here real quick, I, I grabbed this picture based off of this was one of our franchise utilities. If you really look really close, you can actually see where they trenched along the curb line and actually trenched around the car. This was a perfect picture oh my of God. a car actually parked, but they actually trenched around the car back in the day and yeah. and and patched it back. And this is this is where we dropped back and we said enough's enough and we're going to start fixing this and and i guess a key message here like paul says we, we need to fix this and we did we did we got a really strong um policy an engineer that we work with that just is really strong and, and on helping us update all of our standard specs um five back five year payback moratorium we use our pci for payback um, let's say you dig into an 80 PCI road, you're going to do a full payback on that street. Um, if you dig into one that's under 40, you may only have to do a T patch. So uh, that, that's key, uh, making sure that you get those in line along with your program. Um, then next slide. Another big challenge in Ben, uh, Measure 5 and Measure 50 passed back in the late, uh, mid, late 80s, 90s. Um, basically, what that did was it froze all property taxes in the city of Ben mm -hmm. um, to basically 1.2% of assessed value. So this dollar bill represents 22% of Every dollar in the city of Bend goes to public works. That's for all resources in public works. That's general fund, that's everything. Um, out of that, streets and operations received about five to six cents of that 22 cents. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, 
and there was no way to grow or attach, you know, any type of you know, we, we weren't able to capitalize on the general fund or get any more increases from that um, as an option for funding. So going on to, excuse me, Ben's trans transportation history, if you look back at that graph um, that showed our history, they very much aligned from 2008 to, to, to the, until 2024. Um, there's a lot of failures in this, and that's the key. We never stop beating the drum. We never quit. We stay proactively in that uh, arena uh, with our council members, educating, um, never stop. I mean, there's a failed gas tax in there that happened around 2000. 16 2017 um which would have let the tax the uh tourists help pay for the repairs of the roads but um unfortunately we had when you have a council member two council members at odds with each other um and it became a circus and it failed um lost because of that we lost our uh, trust with the community on the, going after a gas tax. The good news is today, uh, 2024, I, I could spend an hour talking about this one slide a little bit. 2024 today, we, as of April 1st, we passed a transportation utility fee dedicated to street maintenance and preservation. And we have lots more on funding coming up later. I'm sure you guys will be excited to hear how they actually were able to get more money for roads. So there's one more little arrow to add next time to that slide. Um, as you all know, and I think everybody faces this, um, along with every all the efforts to try to get funding and, and increases, you know, one of the messages you really have to put forth to when you go after funding with your budget committees or council um, is to show them that the cost of doing business is going up at the same time you're trying to keep pace with it. So um I, i'm showing this you know this is this is our real story with cost of doing business and um, here in bend as we were fighting these challenges for funding and resources so i thought it was an interesting slide so impressive yeah. results um and lots of challenges to overcome and challenges that most agencies i know um can relate to minus the tourism that's uh that is another really significant impact but Let's talk about how you guys did it. <laughs> Let's roll right on into it. All right. Um, it, it took some perseverance. Um, you know, Lindsay made a comment about, um, and just my brain went completely brain. But there is, there's a little bit of a, 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 a theme that we're going to kind of push uh, some of our philosophies. Um, our data, uh, our approach, uh, our training, uh, cost-driven. Um, you know, we're we're going to make sure that we're doing the right road, right treatment. So part of our pavement management program in place, this is a must. If you're a municipality or a city leader or however, this is how you start your pavement reservation program. Um, you know, we have a PCI report. We have a third-party person, uh, CAPS. They come in, they they rate our roads. All that data goes into our Street Saver program. Um, with that, we generate a uh, very five-year uh, comprehensive list. And that's always moving. Um, it's rotating. I'm pulling, I'm pulling roads in if something needs to drop. Or something needs i get extra funding i'm pulling them forward and this is completely data driven and boots on the ground like right road right treatment one of the things that i do is i love is we love the corridor approach um here's an example we had mount washington putnam and uh Shevlin park road they all needed a treatment uh they're all grinding inlay they all touch each other instead of just that was our big payment preservation for that year, uh, let alone uh, in MOBE costs, they were able to roll from one road to the next to the next. And we saved about $60,000 just in MOBE costs from having up, just moving them around. Um, one thing I am very proud of is that in our in-house, we do uh, our own design. 
Uh, I have an in-house design engineer. He works uh, strictly for uh, our department and we have an in-house inspection. So we do everything in-house. Um, great team, a uh, couple great guys, just they, they're dedicated. And they, they just have a passion for it. The other thing I love is our self-perform work. Uh, we have concrete crew, asphalt crew, we have a, a, a sweeper crew, stri striping, legends, uh, vegetation, you name it, uh, we do it. Next slide, Lindsay. So on that real quick, our, Paul mentioned that concrete crew, they're, they design, build in the field. Um, they're very well trained. Uh, that saves a, a ton of money on, on the ADA and PROAG side of things. Yep. And in the last slide, there was a picture of our CAPS report and our budget options report. You know, we use that, you know, Chuck and I will walk around that and that's, you know, that's, you know. That, that's our Bible. That's yeah, that's our Bible. That's how, how we do this. Yeah. So let's roll forward. So treatments with the toolbox that we have. Um, a lot of this is that we can do this in-house or we do it contracted. Crack seal program. Uh, we have two craft co machines that we do all of our own crack seal. Uh, we use Polyflex 547. That works very well for our environment. Uh, chip seal, uh, either contract or a county MOU. Uh, no longer we're working with the county because we've gotten so big that they just cannot service uh, service our needs. Uh, a lot of it is HMAC overlay, our grind and lay, our self perform, and our contracted work. Um, like Chuck said, we have 47 roundabouts. Um, depending if it's asphalt or concrete, when it's time for uh, reconstruct, we take a look at the demographics of each one of those roundabouts. So is it in a shady area? Can we use the asphalt um, to, to hold the heat uh, with the, the freeze and thaw of ice? What's going to be the best? How fast can we go in and, and re, uh, rebuild that roundabout? Uh, 2016, we did College Way uh, shoveling roundabout. Um, we gave the contractor three days. Uh, they started on a Friday night and opened it up on a Sunday, uh, Friday morning and opened it up on a Sunday night. And that was, we did an FD, a full depth reclamation. We did a pay, uh, um, yeah, we put nine inches of asphalt. We capped it with 70, 70, 28 ER. Uh, which was able, able to get in, get it out, and they had bonus pay on that. Um, slurry seal, we're going on our seventh year, and rubberized chip. This created, uh, within Ben, it created a kind of a controversy with uh, rubberized chip, rubberized tire, uh, with rubber getting in the air, getting into the ozone, getting into the water, uh, killing coho salmon. Um, that, that was what they were saying. <laughs> yeah, that you know, it, it, scientists that live here. Pros gone. So that, that was a little bit of a headache for us, and you know, we have a lot of those here. Micros and Cape Seals. Going back real quick on the story, Paul, Paul was seven years prior to Paul and I taking on this program. Ben had never done anything but chip seal and asphalt. There was never any stories, so all of this was new. New Ben just since yep. 2016. So next slide, please. Okay, before the work begins. So this is this is where uh, kind of our where our crews uh, hit the road. Um, you know, either we're going to be looking at it doing full depth, uh, maybe a thin lift overlay, uh, overlay or grind inlay. Uh, some minor asphalt repairs, potholes, root heaves, uh, crack seal, and that's just our asphalt crew. We have a that crew is a, a nine person crew. Uh, we can pull from other crews to help uh, haul asphalt or whatever we need to do. Same thing with our concrete repairs. We have a full concrete crew. We have an ADA crew. They, they can do curbs, sidewalks, uh, et cetera. Both of these groups are very well seasoned. They came from backgrounds of uh, the asphalt lead. I uh, came from uh, a pretty large asphalt uh, company here in town. And same thing with our concrete uh, super uh, lead on that. Along with our vegetation and striping, uh, we do complete street uh, layout. Most of that is completely done for our slurry and just general day-to-day -day maintenance and our chip seal. 
any of our striking and legends will do is, is if it's under the paving will be done through contract uh, along with a full sign shop. And that was one thing that, that Chuck was able to bring in with his expertise is we were able to, to uh, now we're a full service sign shop. We save thousands and thousands of dollars each year time. in time, just building our own signs. We have a dedicated crew. So upper left is our concrete crew putting ADAs in, uh, in there. We average, depending on um, what our workload is, um, Chuck mentioned they dumped $17 million on us for two fiscal years. That crew did well over 300 ramps that year. Um, yeah, and so very dedicated group of guys. Uh, paving crew, we have a paver, we have a paver, we have a full uh, rollers. Um, Josh is on. I'm, you can see me standing there on the left. Josh is on the paver uh, with my inspector. I'm basically uh, on the right there. Where they're paving away. One of the things we do is before contractors get in there, we're in there trimming the trees, doing everything we can uh gear everything up to its where the trucks are not dragging in leaves or pine needles within the truck and then our striping crew um and our crack seal crew so contracted work um this is where a lot of my time is spent uh, with our hmac putting our plan sets together and determining if we have a grind inlay or an overlay project or perpetual paving, paving. Uh, and that's what the roundabout was. Um, I'm a strong component on this. Uh, if, if you have the ability to do that, and especially in roundabouts where you have a lot of pushing and shoving, uh, I look at the 70, uh, 70 28 ER uh, where we do that. Uh, white paving concrete, and again, that's in our roundabouts. Uh, as we are a growing city, we're also getting a lot of uh, concrete paved roads. Um, so we got to always look at the the uh, repairs on that, you know, chinking seal uh, seal joints, so forth, getting that back up to speed. Uh, usually every year um, we do a concrete inspection. I have a, a third party person that comes down and walks it with us, um, gives us a, gives us a report, and that's what we yep. do for repairs. Mhm. Mm so, um, slurry seal, you know, this year, uh, you know, seventh year, um, but I'm really happy with our slurry seal program. Um, we're going to talk about some of our communications, what we do with that, um, and you, you'll understand why uh, complaints. It, this is very little complaints based off this. Uh, chip seal, uh, hot emulsion and or rubber, um, we're good quarter tan or three eighths. And then we do fog seal and then our micros and full depth reclamations. Next slide, Lindsay. Thank you. So um, chip seal up in the upper left, um, paving contractor in the middle upper, and then um, concrete. This is eighth and Franklin on the far right. Um, roundabout, we're doing a complete reconstruct. And we're tearing, we tore all the asphalt out. Uh, this is nine inches of concrete going back in and uh, we did this in less than this project in concrete um, the goal was 15 days we were 18 days out uh, just simply a couple panels didn't come up the strength uh, quick enough to, before we put traffic back on it um, slurry a couple of lower uh, lower left and center and then our lower right is our rubberized chip so a lot of so a, lot, big lot of a big toolbox, yeah. which is very much what we see um, for people who are really reversing the trend of a deteriorating network and seeing their PCI go up and to the right. Every single one I have ever seen has a pretty broad toolbox. Yep. So transparency. Uh, this is our five-year preservation map. Um, this is 25 to 28. Um, this, these are roads that we're put, uh, we're looking at for chip seal slurry inlays and, and overlays, uh, grind inlays. Um, there's a lot of work in this, you know, depending on our funding, if it goes up or down. Right now with the tough coming in, this is more likely going to come, uh, our funding is going to go up. So if I had, this could grow. 
So from 25, I mean, we have year six, year seven. If I get more funding in 25, I'm going to pull from 26. I'm just going to pull it forward. I'm just going to yeah. keep pulling it forward, keep pulling it forward until it's There's another thing that I have heard um, quite a bit from you guys is um, that in, so when you've got more money, you don't look at that as an opportunity just to go repave everything. You're looking right. at how you can invest that money to preserve your good roads, recycle existing roads, and, and and make that money stretch as far as it possibly can, which I think is great. I'm just giving and, us and that, like a fact check, guys. We're getting a little bit um, behind. Yeah. And, and the, the drop back real quick. The years two to three are pretty solid. Um, you know, we're going to go with that and, it, and they're, they're solid. So those are, those are what I'm uh, working on. I can say in 25 right now, um, we're putting plan sets together. We're pulling data for this and we're starting to build our, our 25 plan sets for now. Go ahead, jump to the next one. So our current goals, um, Chuck and I talk about this a lot, comprehensive asset management. This is very strong for us. We're data driven or decision making, uh, preventative maintenance strategy, uh, sustainable practices, funding and budgeting, uh, community engagement and community. That's huge for us. Um, we're gonna, it will, with David Abbas, our director, this is probably number one on his list is what I need to do to make sure that there were uh, transparency. Training and workforce development, we're sending, I got two guys, uh, my design engineer and an inspector, they're up in, uh, they're up in class all week this week. <laughs> so it, this is, this is big. And it just training our, our workforce uh, within, uh, within the agency. Policy and regulatory compliance, uh, performance metrics and evaluation transparency, collaboration and partnerships. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more down, down the, the road. Uh, hopefully we don't run out of time and piggyback uh, off of uh, bids. And when I'm saying piggyback, when Chuck and I started the slurry program, uh, nobody else was doing this. Um, year two, uh, City Redmond jumped in. They piggybacked off of our contract. City of Sisters, Madras, Deschutes County, Prineville, yeah. Jefferson County. These guys, we all allow them. They might have their own separate contract, but it allows them to jump in. Uh, they know that there's square yardage. You can, if you can drive that price down, that can that can be great. That is a huge thing that I see also in areas where um, they're really trying to do more work with less money is getting together with other towns and either mobilizing a contractor to do a lot of work for different communities at one time or piggybacking bids. I think that's a great strategy. And I'm just going to keep us moving, Paul. Hey, go for it. Uh, appetite for new treatment. Chuck and I are always open. We're always looking for new ways to build our toolbox. Um, this year, uh, Chuck and I started talking about emulsion chip seal like four years ago. Um, county was listening to us. Deschutes County did one last year, um, emulsion chip seal with fog seal. And it, we absolutely left. Uh, they jumped on it. Um, it. They think it's probably the best thing it did. Uh, we've it visited some fiber, some fiber roads. Uh, we're probably going to do a lot more uh, fibers if it makes sense. This does add cost to your per ton, anywhere from twelve to eighteen dollars a ton. Um, if you haven't used a, a, a fiber yet, I would strongly probably look at one of those. Uh, we went and looked at a road that had a PCI of two. Uh, they paved it four years ago when we walked it uh, here two weeks ago. The road looks like it's basically six to eight months old. It just it's phenomenal. Now they don't get the traffic great. on there, the load, but it, the thing looks great. Cold in place recycling, ultra bond wearing core sammies, uh, multi layer applications. Um, you know, and we're going to talk about uh, other agencies, our Central Oregon Public War, uh, Partnership. This is where with Deschutes County, Jefferson County, Crick County. Madras, City of Sister City, Redmond, City of Lapine, City of Bend. We all in ODOT, we all collaborate and we get in there and we talk about what's working, what's not. 
inspections. And I know we're running tight on time, so I'm going to kind of push this forward. Um, qualified inspectors. Uh, I make sure that my inspector has all the certified certs that he needs to do his job. Um, Pre-cons, um, when we start the job, is yeah, set mandatory. expectations. And man, it, well, and mandatory certs to make sure he has those. Um, roll right into a pre-con when we get ready to start the job, uh, set expectations. A lot of these contractors that know me, I know a lot of the tricks in the trade back when I was on the private side. Um, I set expectations. I am. I have no problem if the superintendent's not following the rules. I'll shut them down and tell the tell the either, either owner of the company or the head head guy gets down here and we're gonna we'll clean it up. We'll make it right. It's not the first time I've made a, a paver sit for a couple hours. Smittles follow up, follow through, make sure everything is in order before they go. QA QC. This is big to me. Um, I have a lab on speed dial. Uh, I use Carlson testing. Um, they're there for me every time, and I'm not afraid to use them. I'm not afraid to grab a, uh, a quart of oil, send it to the lab. I have my inspector is certified to go. He can actually go pull a sample right off the paper, put it in a box. He'll label it, stamp it, and he'll let us know what load it came from. And then, then the, then the, the. Uh, uh, it's uh, the uh, QC gentleman will come by and pick it up. They'll send it to the lab. Check yep. the boxes, cover your bases. Kind of a off the side is kind of a pre-construction conference checklist, things that I like to do. And every really high quality contractor I know values a partner on the agency side that cares about that inspection and QA, QC as well. Exactly. And, and we'll sit down and we want everybody to make money. We might not agree on it, but the, the, we want them to come back um, year after year after year. And we want them to make money. We're, you know, if they're doing their job, I have zero issues. But and I want to make sure we get to some of the finance stuff, Paul, but I might have you, so I might have you almost skip this slide, but just give us the top line on this. Okay. Synergy. We love working together with the other groups, you know, BNSF, uh, Cascade North Grass. Take, just take advantage of uh, opportunities that might be able to, instead of hitting a single, you're gonna hit a double or a home run. You know, work with other departments, build relationships. Uh, I have a great relationship with BNSF. All of our railroad crossings are compliant. There's an issue with it, that's it. Yeah. No, I think the key there is, you know, if you can get a complete brand new road at the end, um, if they're turning up the road already and going to pay half of it back, you pay back the whole road. Yeah. So. And we've talked to plenty of contractors who have issues where, you know, the utilities side of the agency will cut into the road without communicating with the streets department and just miss an opportunity to do the right thing for that road. So I love that you guys are ahead of that and building those collaborative um, collaborative partnerships. I'm gonna just quickly, one of the big things that I think all of us take away from listening to Chuck and Paul talk is how much attention they put to right treatment on the right road at the right time. If you haven't been to roadresource.org, it's a free resource and I'm just taking you to two sections of the site quickly, one uh, under the treatment toolbox section. This is the, the bulk of the site is right here. Um, and there's two tools to try to figure out what treatment to use for your road. And then the treatment resource center is about 400 pages of technical content organized across 18 different treatments um, to help you understand how to make sure those treatments succeed. So here's, um, this is the criteria tool where you select you know, what condition your pavement is in, what distress it's facing, um, what road type it is, what surface type it is. Um, and then as you do that, it grays out treatments that probably aren't a right fit. And it, it leaves in dark um, the treatments that are a good fit. And if you wanna learn about that, you can click on them, scroll down, you'll get a top line summary. And then it will invite you to go to the Treatment Resource Center. This is that quality control menu or that technical menu I told you about, where you get 23 pages on microsurfacing, pretty well organized by best practices, expectations, how long will it last, 
What are the process and variations? What do I need to know about mix design or spec review? Down through QAQC, research and performance is gonna organize for you the top research out there. And success stories are gonna show you how communities all over the country are using this treatment successfully. Um, so that, that uh, technical menu exists for 18 different treatments. Um, so that's a really valuable part of the site. And the other thing I'll show you is under pavement photo tools. So right here, you can see a bunch of pictures of roads organized from least distressed to most distressed. And if you click on them, it's gonna show you what type of distress you're looking at and what some possible solutions are to explore. If you click on those, it's gonna take you right back to that treatment resource center um, where you can, again, learn everything you need to make sure those treatments succeed. So as you're watching um, Chuck and Paul, who are obviously really far down the road um, in this process, want to make sure you had some of those tools. So um, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'll turn it over okay. to you, Chuck, to talk more about growing a budget. Yeah, that, um, I'll cover this really. I think going back to uh, Paul and I use a lot of that information on um, the resource.com to explain to the public how we what what our project is and what the process is it's really helpful um going back to this slide um i talked about earlier the budget impacts um and this plays this slide really plays into our funding and our resources um, as i talk about this really quick um next slide Um, one of the things we do real quick uh, that Paula talked about the um, budget resource book that we produce every year for our budget process. Um, we use that book to, and every council member gets a copy or, or all of our city manager and all of our budget committee. Um, they can follow along, everything's transparent. Um, we start out, we, when we try, we go for our ask for funding, um, and we give them the four different scenarios. Um, scenario one being unconstrained, that's pie in the sky. That's if we had all the money in the world to get everything done in five years, it would, the whole eight, $83.5 million to get our PCI to 83. Um, that really helps focus them and narrow them into um, what we're talking about when we get down to our true ask. Uh, next slide. I'm just gonna go over a couple of the um, options. One, um, I, what I really want you to focus on is everybody's keyed in on the curve. Um, we've used it in this industry. I don't think there's a person or doesn't put that in their presentation, um, but our council so used to that curve now that, that that's where their eyes go. They look and see results. Um, they want to see the results. So it, it's really a, a helpful tool when you when you present this way to your council. So here's the 83, you know, the unconstrained five-year plan. Next slide. Um, this is, was at the time when we did our budget um, last year. This is what if we would have stayed at our current investment level um, at that time. Um, and, and this demonstrates that cost of doing business is going up at the same time we're asking to maintain our budget level our pci is going to drop um so it it there's there's all those factors built in when you're trying to explain um your budget needs to your elected officials so you know this is an increase of 1.5 million in the impacts to keep our budget our pci level and that's what we've been doing really for the last three years um, in the process of trying to get sustainable funding. Um, basically, it was an increase of about a 500,000 a year to keep up to pace with all the construction costs. Next slide. Well, and the power of this is really being able to manage expectations around <laughs> what type of roads you can expect for what type of money you're willing to put into them. And then I think to give them options it's so powerful when you say, okay, if I want my roads to decline, I can keep spending this. If I if I want to see better roads servicing my community, what do I got to spend to get there? And I think giving them that that sense of reality is really important. 
And, and I think the key to that is the, the council needs to set the, you know, every every year and every new council of re-election, they set goals. And yeah. you're really succeeding if you know that they're setting goals for your PCI every year. Um, yeah. We we get our council to say we want to increase our PCI by one or two over the next biennial budget. That if you're not seeing that in your council goals and transportation focus, you're kind of, you're you're losing ground. So you you need to keep pushing that they set the you know our, our director does a really good job of that in our city manager. Um, as I mentioned earlier, success with our TUF, our transportation utility fee. Um, it's going to ramp up over a period of three years. This year, we received about five million uh, from that, which kind of offsets some general fund for this first year. Increased our pavement preservation program slightly this year, but next year and the following year, um, by the third year, we're looking at um, doubling our pavement preservation money. So, Incredible. and growing at the same time, growing our maintenance um, process. And I congratulations. I mean, I think this is such a great story for you guys out there who feel just frustrated by the budget. You can't, you know, you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. Um, you yeah. can spend smarter and make those dollars go further. But this is a great story of Chuck and Paul doing the right things for their roads, gaining the ground they can over a seven year period and being able to through education and training and consistency, even educating, changing and rotating decision makers, creating a program that's bigger than all of them, and then being able to justify that need for increased funding. It, it's constantly the beating the wrap, drum. Oh, go ahead. Constantly beating the drum, you can't back off. As you can <laughs> see in our history, since 2008, we never stopped. So. Yeah. Uh -uh. <laughs> So there, communication and training, another thing you guys do really, really well, exceptionally well, is communicate to the public, communicate to your department, communicate to your leaders. So tell us a little bit about, about that. So this is this is some of the programs we do within, and this is this starts from the top down. Uh, we have an online map of everything that we're going to do for 24. So if you go to bendoregon.gov and you end up uh, in the streets department or transportation and mobility department, you'll find our street preservation map. Everybody, everything's online transparency. You can see what we're going to do for 2024. Uh, my name is tied to this. My desk phone number is tied to this. You want to talk to me? Go there. You can go to the website. You can, you can uh, look at the map. You can call me. Postcards. Every person within uh, the corridor of the road. So even if they're not their street's not going to be treated, but they have to travel through there. They're going to get a postcard. Uh, anybody that's affected um, off of that will get that postcard. My name, my phone number is tied to that. We're going to throw out PCMS boards um, day of when we're doing no, uh, when we're starting the projects, uh, either is no parking or we'll have type two barricades, no parking. Uh, time, date, when, where, how, communications. We have a weekly traffic road report. Uh, it's tied to an engineer uh, to downtown for radio. the private development. Radio. Yeah, radio news. Uh, they're always doing interviews with me or Chuck. Um, how and often then, Chuck, did you tell me you're on the news? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yep. <laughs> Chuck told me he's on the news at least once a month, a couple times a month. Talking about roads, getting the getting the message out there, making the community proud. Yeah, and door hangers. Let's jump to the next slide. So this is kind of a couple examples of, of uh, you know, our vegetation door hangers. So if we're coming in, we're dropping a door hanger, letting folks know. Uh, PCMS boards, or we're doing a paving notice. On the back side of that paving notice, door hanger, there's a time and date, when, where, and how, what we're doing. And then the public, uh, then the public uh, notice. Training. Um, this is a must. Uh, budget training and seminars, getting getting out in front of these folks, getting our leadership, getting them on, involved, getting them on board, and that'd be our council. Show them what we can do and earn their trust. Um, you know, take the media opportunities, uh, take the social media um, opportunities, mailers, booths, HOAs, downtown events, wherever we can, agency transparency. Uh, and our agency web page. So it, it's sad that people, that most agencies actually cut training. It's one of their first cuts. Yeah. 
I think we're getting a couple, uh, a couple of questions coming in. Um, so um, we'll wrap up this section and then I'll turn to those questions. If there's any other questions, we'll take an extra. I know it's, you know, we're right at time here, um, but we'll take another five to 10 minutes and, and answer um, the questions that came in. So um, go ahead and um, wrap this up. I do think this is really interesting. Comment on that elected officials one. Um, Chuck, I think that was a, a cool thing you mentioned and then we'll, um, Turn it over to the, Get, the you know, getting our councils getting out there you know getting them working rubbing shoulders to, to um with the workers uh with staff the contractors um gives them photo op opportunities to work with the the neighbors that we're affecting you know it, you know just getting them out uh work sessions teaching them and we're talking work sessions david abbas our director has our council speaking PCI. You know, if we can get them to understand what a PCI is and what the value of it is, um, that's huge. It, it's huge. It, it, it just, you know, we're beating the drum every day and it just make it, it, it just, I love it. Go to the next Absolutely. slide. And, and here's where we celebrate is, is the awards. Um, these are just a portion of them. There's still a bunch of them downtown that, that I don't have pictures of, but this is where uh, Chuck and I shine. And every one of them goes to city council at the next meeting of the edit so that yeah. it's televised. Right. Well, you're turning your roads into a point of pride for the community, which is a big deal. And there's, um, there's a road resource award that just got announced. Um, so don't be shy about asking a contractor or a member of EMA areas to nominate you for that. Um, it's, I think anything you can do, it's not, it's not as much, no engineer I know really cares about getting the credit themselves. It's more about turning this program into a mark of pride for the community and warranting additional investment. I'll quickly well, show you this guys and then I'll, and then I'll get to the questions. Um, there's a lot of tools on Road Resource that were designed to help you communicate with taxpayers. So here's pictures of some of them. There's yard signs, there's door hangers, there's social media posts, there's a press release template, there's an awesome like two minute video that explains why we're, why we're treating good roads um, and keeping good roads good um, or why we're recycling pavement and, and things that all help you, all done by a marketing agency to help you communicate to the public. They're all free, um, they're all editable so you can put your community's website information there. Um, and you can find those on Road Resource. I'll, I'll show you where to find them and then I'll turn it over to your questions. Under Resources, Agency Communication Tools. You can download the entire toolkit right there. Um, okay, Chuck and Paul, I'm gonna um, ask you guys a couple questions. Thank you um, for sharing all of that. It's, it really is just incredible. And you're such a good example of what Road Resource is trying to help agencies all over the country figure out how to do. So thanks for, it's a lot of work to put the prep in to deliver one of these. Um, one of the questions in the chat was, can you comment on the level of automation in the PCI data collection process? The level, level of automation? Yeah, in the PCI data collection process. Um, how do you collect that data and how automated is it? We use Street Saver um, as our, our sort of, and like Paul had mentioned in the presentation, we use a third party raider um, to actually go out and raid our roads. Um, currently, we do all of our residentials every two to three years, collectors every two years, and arterials every year. Um, as we we move forward, we're building all this into a dashboard within our department through our uh, operations and operation performance management group, um, and everything is kind of data to dump all of our PCI into um, this dashboard, incorporate proag, incorporate equity um, and incorporate sidewalk complete street approach into it so when we're choosing our roads we're also looking at all the other things that go along with it that we can help improve and become a, you know there's the greenways the bikeway you know biking's huge to our impact impact to our budget now um, that you know it's, and that's growing it's not getting any we're seeing a lot of green paint um, so this dashboard is going to help us look at 
every feature of that road um, along with the PCI uh, uh, rating of that road and help us pick the right treatment and opportunity to redesign for bikes and ped. I hope I answered that right. Um, this is um, related to that, I think. And the question is, do you use an electronic or do you eyeball only to evaluate oh. the PCI? It, it's a combination of boots on the ground, actually. Yeah. And the, the our third party rater uses some electronics, but they have mostly um, some of its roads window survey um, drive by. Um, it's one of the areas that Paul and I are looking at AI. Um, we're, we've even we've met with some companies that provide AI. Um, so we're, we're interested in it and we're entertaining it. Yes. Um, are the cracks and other distresses, this is a clarification on that question, um, manually recorded or automated? I'm going to say manually, because um, if we do any type of treatments that can be that we do in-house, uh, we have a data person that in, inputs it's it all input in here. Instantly after the crews get done. Got it. Okay. Um, how much is budgeted for pavement preservation, rehab, and reconstruction? Right now, for just street preservation for contract, I have uh, $4.5 million. Um, so and I, right now, um, I'm sitting at 4.7. So I will be borrowing from the fiscal year 25 to, to complete, the projects. complete the projects. And how we does that break down like percentage-wise? <laughs> between preservation, rehab, and reconstruction? What what kind of falls in each of those categories from a budget oh. perspective, guys? Ooh. Um, we kind of go off of lane miles, and uh, I try to get through between 16 and 20 lane miles of paving, um, anywhere from 18 to 22 lane miles of either slurry and chip. So depending on how the numbers fall, um, you know, I'm depending on what we want to do, try to keep everything in a corridor. Um, I don't like the one-offs because it costs it costs you too much to run across town. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, try to keep everything grouped, um, but most of our money is going to go into paving. Now, as we transition it'll, through our arterials, switch. It'll, it'll switch. Our arterials and collectors, uh, I'm going to start probably transitioning more money into residential which could be either more chips or more slurry. But okay. then again, right road, right treatment. We don't have, um, a, one thing we don't have in the city of Bend right now is a, a, a capital focus in, in the engineering side of things. There's still not a capital improvement program built in. So everything we're, Paul and I are doing is in maintenance. It's not in our engineering group. So. We're building in some some reconstructs in in our budgeting right now um, of stuff that we just can't let go. Yeah, complete uh, streets. Yeah. Um, this is specific to Street Saver. Do you use the ADA module on Street Saver to assist with treatment costs? I I have to ask Adam exactly how he does that, but. Um, I'm going to say yes, because all the ADAs are inputted in uh, prior to that before. Uh, we we have a guy that's dedicated to Street Saver. He's our data management person. So the um, I think that's an interesting question. And by the way, if, uh, if you join, let you get to hear these guys talk about how they approach ADA, it's such an interesting approach. I've heard so many agencies talk about the ADA rules and regs limiting what they choose to do with their roads um, because they don't want to have to address some of that or they don't have the money in the budget to address it. And the idea of bringing that work in-house so that you can do the right things for roads is just, it's just brilliant. Um, I'm, well, I'm so fascinated by how you guys did that. We could talk about that yeah. in a long time, dude, but um, I know. just real quick, real quick, I mean, when we contract out our, our, our ADA ramps through, in the past, it was about $10,000 a ramp. Um, that's, that's design, engineering, and, and 
the materials and resources. Our crews are doing them for about 2,500 to 3,000 around. So our philosophy is not to let OAG dictate our application. I think Lindsay, you talked a little bit about that. So it gives us the flexibility of, uh, and our crews are, we know they're capable of up to almost 400 ramps a year. Amazing. So it doesn't, it doesn't limit us. So that's all I have on that. And their success rate is, is yeah. through the roof. Yeah. Uh, very seldom do we have to go back and pair them back out yeah. because they're non-compliant. One, even you guys use them for other things like snow work and stuff in the in the winter time. Um, one of the other things that um, I want to just comment on quickly, uh, someone was asking about Street Saver is because I've heard this from a lot of different agencies is it, it's a garbage in, garbage out. You know that there's so much beauty of having a system like Street Saver and having a pavement management system that allows you to really monitor progress, project, plan ahead, all those fantastic things. In some cases, depending on who's programming the data, whether it's a consulting engineer that's familiar with our treatments or with all, with all these different treatments or not, um, you know, if, if you have to make sure that the life extension or structural integrity uh, contribution assigned to those treatments is accurate. Um, we exactly. see agencies, exactly. there's, a, there's a really great uh, webinar from Austin Potts in Polk County, Florida, who talked about how like he's seeing the microsurfacing work, the slurry work, the Kate seals get a lot more life than the um, than the pavement management system is assigning, and that's going to skew results. So what he's doing is really monitoring, especially that all those technologies have advanced dramatically in the last 20 years, 10 years. Uh, so yeah. being able to make sure that it's our data that's a big deal. It's definitely a tool. I mean. For us, it's, it's consistency. You know, we've had people stop in here, oh, we can read your roads better than this. But, we, you know, we want consistency. The, boots on the ground. Boots on the ground. The company does it now. It's consistent. The data goes in consistently. Our data person, Adam, he, he's consistent. Any treatments that we do Up, goes updating in. Updating the, you know, the decision trees and things like that yeah, is yeah. important regularly. It, you know, it's, it's and I give the, the guys, flexibility to say hey this is not what we want to do let's let's take a look at it and it's it's not the first time i have to go Paul, back Paul and i walk every single road that we have on our paper preservation list um, as Amazing. we listen to street saver but then we also go and we walk it uh, that's you guys make me want to quit my job and become a pavement manager and come work for you <laughs> uh, the uh, two more quick questions. Um, one, do you use the remaining service life calculator on the PPRA website? We are dabbling in it. We haven't fully engaged in it yet, but um, the more we've been working with Lindsay and talking about it, it's something that we're, we're, we're gonna have to do a refresher class. It's been a while, but uh, definitely something we're interested in and in adding to our toolbox. So I, um, I'm probably in it every, every day. Um, if it's not, it's at least a couple times a week. This is a great tool. Uh, Chuck and I meet with a lot of HOAs. It's like, okay, what do I do with my HOA? This is the best tool I can refer them to to go show, in. Show them the pictures. Show them the pictures. Go in here. And I, I have a laptop that has a cell card to it, and I can pull it up right then and there and say, this is the best tool for you to guys. And, and I think that's where that that budgeting tool will help a lot as well. In that when we're talking to I want to yeah. want to just answer two more questions, and then I know we're right at time, so I'm gonna let everybody go. People who are asking, you guys can see the screen, right? Chuck and Paul, can you guys see the screen? Okay. Yep. I think I've successfully shared it. Okay. The remaining service life calculator, if you don't know it, is right here. There's for all the calculators. There's an about page, the calculator page, and a video tutorial. This is one of the coolest tools on the whole site. It allows you this, this will teach you all about it. It's a tool for plugging in your treatment plan for the year and determining is that treatment plan gonna take my network forward and in, improve my overall condition or decrease my overall condition. Uh, so really, really fabulous tool. Um, you can watch a video tutorial. Here's a calculator, plug it in on your own roads. Um, we just added a save and upload feature where you can upload data um, and video tutorial on how to do it. There's also webinars on these, so I wanna make sure you guys know about that. And then the last thing I'll show you is, um, there's a question here um, 
from Reese about how uh, how many years of life extension are you getting from Cape, slurry, and fog? Um, and how soon are you implementing them after new service is laid down? I'll let the guys answer, but I wanna show you where you can find that information on here. So under the treatment toolbox, if you go to treatment resource center, let's say we wanted to know about a Cape seal. Well, we'll just click on Cape seal. And then on this page, we'll go to expectations. And expectation shows you um, how that treatment is likely to perform given what type of road you put it on. So if you put a Cape seal on a road with a PCI of 80 or a pavement condition of B versus a PCI of 60, you're gonna get different results. And this is gonna tell you sort of how much life to expect out of that. And, and there's pictures down here of what these treatments look like one, five, eight years in. Um, Cape still has a lot of interest right now from what I can see. Um, and you can find that same information for slurry and fog seal on this site. Um, but do you guys want to just quickly answer that um, Cape Seal, Slurry, and Fog? How how far after a new road do you use them? How many years in? And um, how many years of life extension do you assign? And then after you've answered that, we'll call it a day. Well, we're still trying to get through all of our network, do the funding, but we're going to go through there. But we're going to start cycling through. So our goal is is five to seven. Uh, Chuck has played with some other industry standards he's gotten. I'll let him answer on well, that. Well, I mean, I, I think a lot of it has, like I said, we have three microclimates in town. So a, a slurry on our higher elevations where the temperatures run dip differently and we're south facing slopes and stuff. We So it's kind of very, I mean, I guess that's a quick answer. Um, a lot of it, we're not totally driven by cycle necessarily in the city bend and paul and i are I'm, I'm i don't think either one of us are really uh believers in sticking to a cycle um necessarily um some of it, a lot of it's boots on the ground and looking at the pavement condition is it and, time and the pci and and working it that way um some of it's experimenting uh, we're using new products and we don't know yet if it's going to last the five or seven years um, in the city of Bend and with this climate. So um, we've only got this program seven years old. So we're starting to see some of our materials and collectors circle back around to that seven year mark. Um, yeah. And we're, you know, we're bolstering our, you know, some of our in-house stuff like the crack seal programs and stuff to time into that. Um, and pulling that all together. We're making some shifts in all the time, but right now we're looking at that five to seven year um, with the applications we're doing. Awesome. Well, you guys, uh, thank you. Thank you so much um, for all the work you put into today and just even more than that, thanks for the, the work you do that you never get thanks for. Um, and thanks for serving as such a wonderful uh, inspiration to pavement managers out there who are really determined to do the right things for their roads and with their taxpayer dollars. You guys are just people absolutely out there brilliant. Got, people out there got good ideas for us, send us an email. We're open to try anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. so. <laughs> uh, well, thanks so much, you guys. Have a great day. Thank you.